and welcome to the TDS Talking Early Years podcast. Each week we'll be joined by educational experts from across the globe, offering exclusive insights, inspiration and guidance to help practitioners unlock the potential of learning in the early years. Welcome back to the TDS Talking Early Years podcast with me, Alistair Bryce Clegg, and my guest, Sam Delakia. And we are talking about emotional regulation, resilience, and all of those things that we can do as practitioners to really empower our children, not just in the early years, but to take those like precious skills and be able to apply them in their adult life. And in this episode, Sam, I want to talk a little bit more. We mentioned at the end of the last one about the idea of the importance of co-regulation, a term that's used a lot but it would be really good if we could just start with a kind of definition of what do we mean by co-regulation and how does it work? So I always think of it as, you know, we have child-led learning. Um, well, this is adult-led regulation. <laughs> um, and I, you know, and I think that actually when we are thinking about our staff um, or ourselves, I think it's really important that our needs are met. It's that whole, you know, the whole ideology of oxygen masks um, when it comes to emotional regulation, isn't it? If we're dysregulated as adults, that is going to absolutely feed into the dysregulation of the children around us because they are little mirrors, you know, and, and they, in fact, there is a part of the brain, the, the mirror neuron that is, is built for that. <laughs> they are meant to, we're meant to as human beings mirror each other to, to form connection, uh, to feel safe and, and be part of the herd, you know, like well, that it's ingrained in us. Um, it, it's, it's something that is really important. So when we're thinking about emotional regulation, co-regulation is leading the way so for example when I so I I'm a, a pretty bubbly human being as you can probably tell I'm a pretty high energy person my classrooms were always rather intense I'm not gonna lie yeah. um, they were very full of energy my children were always kind of moving around and talking because that's how I, I taught from the get-go um, I couldn't have had you know long periods on the carpet I, I couldn't have sat for that long yeah. <laughs> So my energy in the classroom was always pretty high. And I really remember kind of thinking about this in more depth, not as emotional regulation as we know it. And um, this is long before these conversations were happening. This is a long time ago. Um, but I remember a member of staff coming into my classroom and I'd not been well. And they were saying to me, Sam, what's happened in here? And I was like, what? She was like, you know, what's gone wrong? You're like, the classroom's so quiet. Like, why are the kids so quiet? And it's because I'd not been well. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm just not feeling it today, you know. Um, and that was the first time I really thought about this because it wasn't, it was up until then, I just took it for granted that I just had bubbly classes, you know, and everyone would be like, I want your class next, you know, because my class are always like, woohoo, come on, let's go. <laughs> um, but actually, it was because my regulation was a high energy regulation. So, I mean, for some children, of course, it was too much because their sensory input was like, whoa, this teacher yeah. is off the scale. Down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, crank it, crank it down, please. Um, but actually, thinking about co-regulation that is what we want to be able to do is bring our children up with our you know nervous system and then bring them down when they need it um and it was only then that i started to think about this as as a thing um and obviously didn't even you know understand all of this stuff until i came to into the coaching industry actually and, and looked at kind of the nlp side of things and and what happens within in our minds and and how that impacts our emotions but when we want to facilitate co-regulation, we have to do it first, which is actually really gorgeous because it does mean that we can bring these things into our classroom and benefit from it, yep. first of all, <laughs> as well as knowing that it's going to benefit the little ones that we work with. But also as a strategy that you're going to lead the way and mm -hmm. rather than waiting for it to happen is a really positive strategy because you are setting the tone for how you want things to be or you're responding to what goes on within your space. And I think you know, you're right about the contagion. There is a contagion factor around mood and feel. Yeah. And so you see that bubble up in children. So I, again, 
I mean, a lot of my senses start. I was working a setting recently, but it was a setting where there were uh, two boys playing with cars on a ramp. And it started off with just the two of them, but then the game got really exciting and then more joined and more joined. And you could actually feel in the room the kind of electricness of that. And that was quite a big high octane thing. But then another time, it was somebody building a tower out of bricks that was getting wobblier and wobbler and it wobbler, wobblier and wobblier as it got taller. And again, it wasn't a lot of high octane noise, but everybody was suddenly engaged with the kind of atmosphere of this is going to fall any second now. And that's really yeah. exciting. So it's really good to think that as adults, we can lead that, but we can also promote the good stuff. We can quash the not so good stuff by intervention and a bit of coaching, but also generate that feeling of positivity in the space rather than a feeling of negativity by just your own mood and your own emotion. Absolutely. And if you think about, if you think about it, we do it really naturally. You know, when you have babies and they cry, you pick them up and we bounce. Yeah. I mean, this is like a, an ingrained thing. Yeah. And so that, that in itself is a, a regulation support. You know, the idea that we slow our breathing or we kind of, you know, to, to regulate our heartbeat so that they can regulate their heartbeat. This is something that, you know, is, is nature's way. It, it's there from the very get go. And we can facilitate that with so many humans around us. I mean, you just have to go to a concert, for example, or, you know, like you were saying with the, the tower, you can feed off of the energy, yeah. you know, you can how you have thousands and thousands of people regulated at the same pace, you know, you're kind of jumping around having a party because it's, it's that, as you said, it's, it's emotional, like passing it on. It is contagious. It's, it's, it's something that we get to do as human beings without realizing it, but it's the, without realizing it bit, that's the problem. <laughs> I think, and then children, as we've talked about in previous episodes, I mean, everybody knows that other adult that has the wobbly knee that can't keep it still. Um, and for lots of human beings, we physically move to regulate our mm. emotion. And we recognize that in adults. But when we've got children who need to physically move or touch or do whatever they need to do on the carpet, because we keep them still wherever they are in their play, again, we tend to fall on the side of stop doing that everybody put your hands on your knees or everybody put your fingers in the air. And I get sometimes that's about just getting everybody's attention in, within the group to give an instruction. But often it becomes that if you're not sitting still, then you're not paying attention. Well, actually, what we are saying is physiologically, for some people, movement is the way that they pay attention. So by stopping it, what we're actually doing as practitioners is stopping children from being attentive and taking them into a space where they're having to regulate everything their muscles their bodies their brains their core and it all becomes about the regulation and not about what's going on around them. absolutely absolutely and I, you know when we're when we're thinking about this <clears throat> i also when i when i train i always teach physiology first so we have three pillars in everything that we t we do in in terms of our develop our um, programs we have physiology beliefs and then communication because physiology shifts all that we feel so if you are and you'll notice it if you've been to the gym or you've gone for a run or even if you've run for the bus you know your mood shifts because motion processes emotion so if we're kind of moving our bodies we're we're shifting we're, we're changing vibration and if we are shifting our physiology first i mean one thing i used to do and you can do in your settings was i would start the day with a dance so yeah. the children, I mean, so many, you can go into so many settings, they'll play calming music, which is lovely. Yeah, it's really nice. But if you've got children who are coming in with a really jam-packed emotional backpack, calm, sitting there calmly is just going to be time to think. And time to think is going to be based on the emotions they're feeling and, and create more of that. Whereas if you want to shift their mood, put on a fun, a fun um, song, a tune. Get them moving, get them dancing around, having a bit of silliness and first. Expect them to and move. Then bring them back yeah. down when they've Absolutely. emptied the backpack. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then they're feeling good and they can sit yeah. feeling good. 
which is another, I mean, we talked about it before, but another reason why I don't advocate with settings that I work with, that we all come in and sit down. You need to come in and move, whether that be to, to dance or just to be in provision, or mm-hmm. you need time to assimilate to the space that yeah. you are in. But also, like again, in a setting where it was tidy up time and they played the Mission Impossible music, which is great and not unusual, but really loud. And the teacher's like, right, come on, tidy up. And of course, they didn't tidy up. A, a group of, again, of boys just went mad, chucking stuff about, dancing, jumping around. And then, of course, the music got stopped and the adult was like, right, 10 fingers. It's tidy up time, boys, coming out. And I thought, well, if you hadn't put that music on full blast and gone in with it, right, let's get tidy, they probably would have complied a little more. I mean, we could also discuss tidy up time at length. As a whole other thing. <laughs> as a whole other thing. Um, can I ask you, because we've been bold in this series, um, around two things that I see a lot of, and I would be interested in your view on them. So mm-hmm. one is the idea that when children come in, they select a mood from, so they'll have four broad moods, happy, sad, whatever, angry, and you take your face, the last one I saw was on a, bel- a their photograph of their face on Velcro, and you stick it under which mood you're in as you walk through the door, and that dictates your mood for the day. Mm-hmm. And the other kind of link to that are the books like Mood Monsters, where we will use those as adults, and again I've seen it in settings where you've got a mood monster on a stick, and you have to say which mood you are. And I think that's used a lot for adults then being able to say, I ask my children what their emotional regulation is, or temperature is, and therefore I am doing what I need to do. Yeah. I think this is a really difficult one because I I think awareness, so I, one of the things that we talk about a lot in as a progressive practice and is, is having the art of it. So awareness, reflection, and then transformation. Um, and awareness of your current situation is, is the first port of call in moving forwards, right? We can't move from our space if we don't know where we are. Yeah it's not possible so I think yes children need to be aware of where they are but I think what the difficulty is is when we just have a check-in when we just say oh where are you oh, okay great okay so you're feeling low excellent okay so you go and sit down on the carpet now <laughs> um, I think there's no progression so it's not enough to and if you're doing that if you're like oh well I, I do a check-in with my kids every morning I thought this was good know that you're on the first step right no doubt this is not a criticism at all because this first step is better than no step right progress is better than no progress um but what we want is to follow that up so okay we are and there are thousands and thousands i think there's something like six thousand emotive words and we use like four (laughs) they are people (laughs) if that um you know so there are loads of loads of emotions that we do not talk to our children about um we don't talk to our children about what it is they're feeling and where they're feeling it and how intense they're feeling it so they label it they might be labeling it incorrectly they might be you know it it needs to be part of a wider discussion um but also it needs to be about where are you but where do you want to be and how you're going to get there so if your children are coming into your classroom i always suggest that you do a check-in yeah okay we want to know where you're at but also where do you want to be so an um an energy scale is good for this you know if you come in on a on a two and you're like hmm I've picked up my, my my blue monster. I'm not feeling too great, but actually, I want to be on a a six because that's that's where my vibration is at best. You know, that's where my learning mode is. How am I going to get there? I'm going to go to my balance zone, and I'm going to use one of the the tools in there that I know is going to work for me. Um, I think you have to have it followed up. I think it's a great first step. It has to come with the rest of the journey. You don't put in your sat nav your location and not your destination. Exactly. You have to have, there is an, I, one of the things, the tools that we have um, is the road to regulation. Because yes, the zones of regulation is fantastic in, you know, again, a starting point to talk and build awareness and reflection. But transformation takes the teaching of skill. Yeah. It takes the, the understanding of where you're getting to. So the road to regulation breaks that down. So you can look at your mood, look at your energy, look at where you are, look at the tools and skills you need to get there do it <laughs> you gotta do it and then check in again are you there what do you need do you need to top up do you need to change again um and yes this does take time but i always say you know it's better to invest the time in those earlier 
you know years or earlier days you know the first week of term re you know re-establish these things might even be on a Monday morning after the weekend you know re-establish it and then take them through that process because it's all about process and I think we celebrate success we celebrate you know the celebrate get that word out the goal but often the goal is the process and we miss it yeah and I think it's also about modeling so adults Mm -hmm. need to be able to model so just because you are a practitioner stood in front of a group of children doesn't mean you're infallible and actually it's really good when you can say I got that wrong or I mean don't go into the in-depth about your personal difficulties but say (laughs) I don't feel great today but also if I'm four I might not be able to sell you on a scale of one to ten yet where I am so that you're right that's going to take modeling but I think what we're talking about is the fact that you model that through a lot of talk, a lot of experience, a lot of you helping children to articulate where you think they are. And that idea of saying, right, I've come in and I feel a bit fed up. And you as a practitioner being able to say, right, we know the things that help you not to feel fed up are whatever, construction, painting, chatting to a friend, having a run round on that yellow scooter that you really love. So we start your day with the painting, the construction, the scooter. And then we then, because we've had this conversation, we're saying, right, you've, you've been round the track 60 t- times on the scooter. Yeah. You took out two small girls and a lady in a tabard. How do you feel now? And that is way more impactful. Because also, I might get in the morning and feel like a million dollars. And by half past 10, because my inbox is full or whatever, you know, I've got kids. So I might not feel as bubbly as I did. Or conversely, I might get up feeling miserable, I might go for a run, or somebody buys me an unexpected arm and croissant, and then suddenly, you know, my day has lifted. So if we just ask children at nine o'clock, how are you feeling? We don't want that to be, and that's how you are feeling for the day. And also, sometimes, yes, it's good for children to label their emotion and where they're at. But also, if we don't do what you've suggested, which is the, but where do you want to be? They then just wear that label. So I came in feeling fed up. I've identified myself as fed up. And so I am fed up today. If we come and say, I'm feeling fed up, don't worry. We can sort fed up out. How do we sort it out? Well, we're going to try this. And then you're going to talk to me about it. Because part of that also, as the next bit we're going to chat about really, is building those really healthy, positive relationships. Where in co-regulation, as you've said, the adult is leading but there's got to be a, it's cool. So the important bit is that kind of strong and healthy relationship you have with the child. Mm, absolutely. And I think, you know, when we do that, one of the things, and you mentioned, you know, modeling, um, just as kind of add to what you were saying is there is nothing wrong with you saying, I am feeling a bit, do you mind if we have a little bit of a dance? Can you tell I like dancing? <laughs> But you know, you're kind of. Do you mind if we do that? Because I need. I that's what my, that's what my body needs right now. Is anyone else feeling that? And if you're not, then maybe you could just go and you know take a moment, do what you feel you need, and come back to me. And then can we carry on? And I think we cram our day. It has to be said, we cram our day, our school day particularly, so much with the curriculum stuff that there is not time for the stuff that accesses the curriculum. Yeah, it's all about right? And it's all about lessons and learning. But I think we forget that underneath learning is emotional regulation. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you are the best educator <laughs> in the world, if you are not co-regulating and you are not taking in you know, their physiology, if you are not taking in their emotional state, it doesn't matter what, you're, what they're hearing they're too busy with their internal world to work out what's happening in the external world. Yes, and that's really, balance, isn't it? Yeah, and what we're really saying is this has to come first because it is the most yeah. important thing. If you haven't got this sorted, it doesn't matter what else you do with your day, it's not going to make a difference. And of course, as early as practitioners, when we're coaching and teaching, we're going to fake it. We're going to come in and say, do you know what? I feel really cross because and make whatever reason you want to. And you may not feel really cross, but you're going to do that So, because somebody will be sitting there feeling really cross or really sad or really happy. And again, it's all that given strategies, you know, leading as the adult, but starting your day with trying to foster a space, an atmosphere, a relationship of positive emotional engagement interaction, which then opens the doors for all that other stuff, all the other good stuff that we want to get done. 
Absolutely. And on that note, uh, which again is a really lovely way to reflect, I think, on us as practitioners and how we bring a mood into a space or how we've got the power to manage that mood, we're going to draw this episode to a close. And when we come back, it'll be our fourth and final episode. And Sam and I are going to discuss some practical strategies that can just help you as practitioners to do all of the things that we've talked about in the previous three episodes. So join us then. I'd just like to say a huge thank you to our guest, Sam, for joining us and providing such interesting and valuable insights. You've been listening to the TTS Talking Early Years podcast with me, Astor Price Clegg, and Sam Delarkia. And if you've been inspired by our conversation today, then don't forget, you can sign up via the link in the episode notes to be the first to hear about future episodes and access exclusive follow-up content, including ideas for your setting and links to relevant resources. 